the topic that we're doing today is uh, what makes regions competitive in the uh, global economy. Um, and today uh, we have our, uh, our panelists. We have uh, Erica Mann, the Executive Vice President of the Computer and Communications Industry Association and an Atlantic Council Senior Fellow. Uh, we have uh, Tsvetan Vasiliev, uh, Chairman of the Supervisory Board of the Corporate Commercial Bank uh, in Bulgaria, and Mateusz Morawiecki, Chief Executive of the Bank Zachodni Wubeka, one of Poland's leading banks. Um, the whole issue of, of uh, uh, I'm, f I'm focusing in this panel more on CE, but, but both uh, the audience questions and the panelists could broaden that into uh, a wider look on uh, uh, how regions uh, uh, act together to be, to be more competitive. Um, in focusing on the CE, the, the whole question of uh, is a region competitive or not would have been completely ridiculous to a bit more than two decades ago because this region wasn't uh, really a part of the global economy. Uh, it made uh, products that were completely uncompetitive Sorry, first of all, for misreading the program, we're not competing with shale gas, we're competing with Belarus, which is also an interesting topic. And uh, I've been told that I'm a little too Teutonic in, in starting the panel exactly at the time it's supposed to start. So, exactly, it's a problem with having a German wife. Um, so to get back to, to where I was before the, uh, the announcement, uh, so this region was, was completely uncompetitive, uh, not really part at all of the, uh, of the global economy. And then since then, anybody, I mean, just looking at, at Wrocław and now, um, uh, this is, this, the whole region has made enormous strides um, and has become fully integrated into the, into the global economy. I mean, you've, got, you've got businesses here in the Czech Republic and Slovakia and across the region who are essentially fully integrated into the German supply chain. They're riding on the back of Germany's export boom. Um, and for many years, the, this, uh, the crucial advantage of the CE was um, fairly cheap labor uh, at, uh, and very skilled labor as well. Um, while that's still an important asset, um, if you look at wage rates, they're about a fifth of what the German wage rates are for similarly qualified workers. Um, but the, uh, the advantage is, is slowly eroding, and the, this whole region is having to uh, clamber up the, uh, up the value chain and, uh, and look for developing its own companies uh, and invest, increasing investment, uh, pushing uh, higher tech uh, solutions as well. Um, some, of the, some of the things that are holding this region back, we've got very bad road infrastructure across the region. Anybody who drove here would, would have seen that. Um, uh, high levels of bureaucracy and very low levels of R&D spending. Uh, while if you look on the positive side of the ledger, generally uh, the countries have very good internet infrastructure because it's, it's brand new. There's an entrepreneurial drive in these countries which uh, often doesn't exist in, um, in Western Europe. And these countries are also uh, very used to wrenching change, which Western Europeans are not. I uh, talked to Marek Belka, the head of the uh, Polish Central Bank, a couple of days ago, and he contrasted um, what happened in Latvia during the crisis with what's happening in Greece, that the Latvians were uh, prepared to uh, accept a, uh, their economy shrinking by a fifth, uh, uh, dramatic steps which were completely unacceptable to anybody in Western Europe, while the Greeks are uh, failing to implement much milder reforms than the, uh, than the Latvians uh, accepted. Um, I'd like to start with uh, a question which could undermine the premise of the whole panel, I guess. Uh, 
is there even a Central and East European region uh, at all? I mean, if you look at from Bulgaria and the issues that Bulgaria has post-crisis trying to return to growth uh, through the Czech Republic, which isn't really a developing economy anymore uh, when uh, the IMF and the World Bank do their statistics. Uh, they have to put asterisks next to the Czech, or Czech Republic because the Czechs get very upset if they're uh, considered part of emerging Europe. They're, according to them, they've emerged. Uh, they're no longer emerging. To Estonia, which is in the Eurozone, um, is the only thing that in any way holds these countries together, a common past of uh, communism and Russian domination and that they're increasingly diverging. And so maybe I'll ask uh, Mr. Morawiecki to, uh, do we even have a region to talk about? I think, I think that we, ha we do have a region like CE. Of course, there are a number of um, different factors which uh, differentiate countries from each other. But I, I think a, a very uh, dominant um, element which, which makes it a, a region is the uh, communism uh, heritage or um, a joint experience of, the, of 50 years of, or, or more of, of communism. Uh, more because for, for Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia it, 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 it was a little bit more. And, and I happen to believe that this, is such a, such a, this was such an important experience, such a, such a terrible experience at the same time for, for all those countries, that you cannot uh, say that uh, the Western economy, which developed on, uh, on its own uh, rail track, uh, can be uh, compared uh, without taking this experience into uh, consideration compared with, um, with Eastern Europe. J just a very quick example. Uh, Poland and Spain, very similar countries, 35 million people in 1950. Right after the war, so after six years of war and a couple of, a couple of years of communism, the same level of GDP per capita back then. And after 50 years, Spain has now uh, exactly doubled the, the amount of money uh, per capita uh, as Poland has. It, it cannot uh, go uh, unnoticed. And maybe to be a little bit provocative to what Jan said about um, uh, endurance and uh, tenacity of some of the nations which can, like Latvians, which, which took the hit of, uh, of the crisis bravely and, 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 and the Greeks didn't. I, 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 and I, this was mentioned in the first panel this, this morning as well by, by Mr. Reiter. I, I would say to this that actually we should be cautious in praising the, the Baltic sta states because at the same time, over the last 10 years, they lost 20% of their population. Just one or two weeks ago, there was a Lithuanian's um, uh, final count, uh, counting of, of population. And uh, from 3.7 million, they are now 2.9 million a na nation. And this all happened uh, also, also not, not exclusively, but because of those very severe times uh, last couple of years, and of course, before the crisis as well. So, uh, I, 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 being provocative, maybe this was in the interest of some Western states to, uh, to absorb uh, um, uh, millions and millions of cheap and, and relatively well skilled, skilled, as you said, young labor force. But was it in the interest of those countries? I'm, I'm not so sure. I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't give a, a, very, a ready recipe what, what sh should have happened instead. I know this was a very uh, difficult predicament. So what's another ingredient which is, in my view, connecting the countries in Central and Eastern Europe? I think a little bit outmoded, uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote a, a nice book 15 years ago, or when was it? Um, capitalism, uh, or a key um, feature of the capitalism is, is, is trust as, as the social capital. Trust as the social capital. And uh, a, a common ingredient of all the post-communist countries is very little of those social capital, unfortunately. So we are rebuilding this. Uh, the society and the trust in the society is lower than in, uh, in the other countries. Like, I, I work in, in, in a bank for a number of years. There's my colleague Martin Ring with me here sitting in the audience, and he knows very well as well that, that actually we, we had to impose many more procedures in our operations than in the Western banks. Why was that? Exactly for the reason, because we didn't have uh, this, this trust, this, this social fabric developed as, as the, other, uh, the other countries. 
One other feature which is maybe more positive than, um, than in currently in the Western Europe, it's, it is flexibility. Because uh, in, in the con communist time, during the communist time, uh, many, many people had to be very, very flexible in all the, their political, economic, and social aspirations, so to say. Uh, and also in, uh, in the transformation era, uh, this flexibility was kind of ingrained. People changed their behavior, their occupations, their jobs many times. And there was a high level of unemployment and so on and so forth. Poland and the other countries of CEE as well. I would say that this flexibility can be quite kind of um, uh, um, uh, advantage right now. And, and, why, and maybe into the foreseeable future as well. Why, why is that? Because as uh, maybe for non-economists, I will, I, will, I will tell about one index, VIX index, VIX index. It's a basic major measure of volatility in the financial markets, in the com commodity and asset, asset markets. And now, just give me, a, let, let me give you the, um, three figures. Before 2007, the VIX index was 20. Whatever it means. During the crisis 2009, 2010, it was up to 45. Incredible volatility and very bad situation for, for financial markets and, and for real markets. Now it's 35. And as the head of PIMCO, Mohammed Al Aryan, is saying, uh, there, there will be a new normal now. There, there is, the the Tosa Nevrati, as the Czech guys are, are, are saying, uh, so, so there won't be any back to, to, the, to the past. Um, we, we will need more of this flexi flexibility, agility, and I think that the, this can be a very positive common feature of, uh, of, this, uh, of, of those countries. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll stop here, Jan. Uh, just thanks, uh, Svetlana. Do you, looking at it from sort of the bottom end of Europe, uh, do you uh, do you see uh, parallels, uh, common paths, uh, some sort of a regional cohesion that could actually uh, serve serve the whole of the CE in the future, or do you, or is each country on a on a on its own path that you can't really uh, build a, a sort of a, a regional cohesiveness on? No, of course, uh, there are some similarities between the countries. Uh, my colleague already mentioned some of them. But I would like uh, to focus on uh, a little bit different approach. I think that one of the most important things which are separating uh, those countries from, uh, let's say, the other member, EU members is, uh, uh, is a situation that uh, practically they are, uh, for this uh, period of transition, they are in a constantly crisis. So people in our countries uh, appear uh, much more well prepared for, uh, for the, uh, this, uh, for the uh, uh, challenges of the crisis uh, than the people in, uh, in other countries, let's say like uh, Greece, uh, like uh, Portugal, uh, and other in trouble. Uh, so uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, Marek Belke uh, had the right uh, to, to compare uh, Latvia and Greece and uh, Maybe Greece will need uh, uh, much deeper uh, reforms than they are now accepting. But in general, in my opinion, uh, I think that uh, a neoliberal uh, uh, direction of development of, uh, of uh, free market uh, countries uh, need to change now. And that the direction is uh, important and this to be solved and decided not only by our countries but also by uh, well-developed countries. So this is a common task. So uh, maybe our countries uh, now uh, are better filled for, for this improvement because uh, most of them uh, we, we passed uh, through a different type of crisis uh, more recently than, than the other countries. So, 
finally, Poland uh, had uh, hyperinflation in 1989. My country had the hyperinflation in 1996-1997. In, uh, in so this practically uh, shows that uh, capital, uh, capitalist cycle was somehow modified in, uh, in uh, Western countries, which uh, now is, uh, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest reasons of so deep uh, depression we are, uh, we are, uh, we are facing. So uh, for me, uh, uh, the competitiveness of, uh, of the region is now mainly based on macroeconomic stability compared to the, to the situation in, in uh, most of the Western countries, because uh, uh, because the budget deficit is uh, in these countries, uh, with small exceptions, is uh, is uh, one of the lowest. The indebtedness of those countries is very low, uh, which is uh, a let's say good at least starting position for improvement. Of course, the problem is still. If, uh, 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 in the fact that it's not a knowledge, uh, this, the economies of these countries, of course with uh, uh, small ex uh, exceptions, are not a knowledge-based economies. And uh, I am sure that the responsibility for the improvement of, of the economies is not only a problem of uh, governments of those countries, but also uh, this uh, must be a, a first uh, uh, goal for the uh, 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 European community at all. Thank you. Uh, thanks. So essentially, that the uh, that the region has achieved a level of stability which which we don't have yet in Western Europe. Um, uh, again, when I was talking to Belka, to Marek Belka a, a few days ago, one of the points he ma he made was that he's uh, increasingly annoyed with uh, Western Europe feeling it has anything to lecture and to teach uh, Central Europe that this is a region which has undergone change, is much leaner, uh, uh, much more flexible economies. Uh, and uh, as he said, you know, we have, we have very little to learn from our brothers uh, in the faith. And uh, as a representative of the rich uh, half of, uh, of the continent, um, do you think that's true? Is there, uh, has this region learned its lessons so well that actually it should be now Western Europe, which, which looks to some of the solutions, some of the ways that, uh, that um, Central Europe has dealt with crises, has reformed its economies when it's dealing with its own crises right now? Yeah, probably that's true. I mean, um, but one should not forget, I mean, that we had tough times as well. I mean, when you look to Germany, I mean, we had a government, uh, the Schroeder government, my own, I mean, my own uh, party, Social Democrat, I mean, which tumbled uh, and actually failed because of the reform agenda um, the government introduced. Um, and so, um, I mean, yes, uh, it is important um, to undertake reforms. And I think this, um, the, the region, um, here has a huge challenge uh, because it, 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 it partly and uh, it relates to the mentality, uh, how you master uh, your future and how you can overcome obstacles. Uh, it's not just you know about the economic um, uh, side and, and the wealth you create, but it's on the other side the mentality question as well. So if you're well prepared, um, and I think most of the countries are, you can master the future much much more easily. Um, and if you allow me maybe to, to look back, because I, I was until, uh, two to, from two to, um, 1994 until 2009 a member of the European Parliament, so I had to deal uh, with the question all the time, why are some regions strong and why some uh, regions are weak and why can some regions master um, the, the challenges and why have some regions difficulty? And this is true when you look all over Europe, um, I mean, we have uh, master examples in Germany, regions which are doing perfectly well. Um, and we have great examples of small countries which are doing uh, perfectly well um, inside and outside of the European Union. Um, and, and we have um, states and, and regions which fail. Um, and there is an answer, there must be an answer found to it. Why? And the same is true 
uh, for the CE countries. Now, am I, am I allowed to to I see you're angling you towards to do it? your uh, yes, I would love Richard to. Florida's uh, thesis. So absolutely, if you could, if okay. you could talk a bit about because, that. Because because I'm I worked on it and I still work on it because I'm I'm fascinated by this question and um, I I studied uh, personally over the 15 years when I was in the parliament. I looked around at examples which are doing well and examples which are doing less well. I mean, the, one of the most recent and prominent one is Singapore, which had just such a poor past. And when you look um, since, I mean, uh, they changed policy, how strong this region and the country is now. Now, when you, I'm, I'm, my, one of my, my favorite books is uh, from Richard Florida, uh, Who's Your City? Um, this guy did something and the team uh, surrounding him did something fascinating. He just took satellite photos and uh, from uh, the night, and where he saw light pattern over, he he just estimated that there are strong regions behind it. And then he took the data, uh, the economic data, and the science data, um, the pattern data. So all the data is available, um, you know, which can prove that it's a strong region. Uh, and actually, he found proof. Now, one of the most fascinating story which I then saw, and because I was always believing one of the most important um, um, region in the world is California, which is, um, depending on the data, either number six or number nine. But then he told me, or his book, and uh, told me that actually number four uh, is a region in Europe where I live, which is Brussels, Amsterdam, uh, and Twerp. So, and, and he said, just get rid of this idea um, that you know nations are thriving economies. He said that it's regions which are thriving economies. And this would be in, in, uh, in our area, uh, CE, the only numbers I could found, um, and I could follow up and I could check, it's Vienna, uh, Budapest, and Bratislava. Uh, now you can look into other um, areas and other regions where you will find similarities. And I like this because it's, you know, it's this idea that nations can define the future of people. It's probably not true any longer. Nations are important, and governments of nations are important, but it's the, the wealth creation happens in areas which go across nations. Um, now, this is not if you have a huge uh, area like Russia. Of course, the story is different, or you have a huge uh, country like um, one has to be very careful when it's those kind of um, uh, data. Uh, when you have the uh, area like uh, California, the story differs. But nevertheless, there's a lot of truth about it, and in Europe. Definitely. So I, I, I would argue, yes, if Europe can really overcome this very inward-looking uh, point of view or very inward-looking policy and really, you know, def defines policy in a, in, a, in a different way, really arguing, reach out, you know, build your, wherever you are placed, wherever you are situated, build on, your, on the basis, on your history, on the knowledge, on, on your... Pro uh, country or regional profile, build your uh, expertise, um, I think we would be much better off, and, and this region even more so. Uh, uh, as you were, were talking, um, I, I tried to think of where, besides the Vienna, Budapest, Bratislava triangle, where you would have uh, a region either within a country or straddling borders in CE that would have the bulk and be able to, to be sort of a driver for regional growth. And I didn't come up with any. So uh, maybe the other panelists, do you have any ideas of, of where you could end up with, or where you do have nascent uh, regional hubs like that, uh, like the Brussels, Antwerp uh, uh, type, of, type of hub uh, in, in our region? But I, I think that uh, Central Central Europe developed slightly different than, than in Western Europe. And as you can look around, there are no major, huge behemoth-type cities like Paris and London, 10 million people and so on. So uh, to your question, Jan, I would say uh, like that, there, that the countries are more evenly uh, developed than, than some of the Western na nations and not as concentrated as as, as, as uh, some of them. Uh, and I think it can be, again, an advantage uh, going forward. But, this, but we need uh, uh, maybe a couple of those smaller locomotives, which, which in Poland we have, actually, this, this city where we, we are now, Wrocław and Poznań, Kraków, and, of course, Warsaw and Gdańsk. 
they are uh, rapidly developing cities and, and, and uh, similarly in in, uh, the, in the Czech Republic and, and the other countries. So uh, the, my question is no, no NTS. I, I don't see such uh, accumulation of uh, development, but, but at the same time, I think that this more evenly uh, spread development is, is, is kind of uh, strength. I looked at, at a different um, comparison to um, than, than this uh, look from the satellite um, or high-level picture. Uh, I looked into the report of World Bank about doing business, which is uh, what, how difficult or how easy is doing business in, uh, in different parts of the, of the world. And actually, uh, this comparison is, 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 is very powerful for me as well, because uh, if you think that, for instance, Scandinavian countries are very well developed and good prospects ahead of them, then you're right. Probably when you look into this index, they are, they are very high in, the, the, in doing business uh, index. Uh, high, I mean, the, um, uh, setting up business, closing business, receiving all the permissions and permits to, to do business are very easy there. And, 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 and also in the United States and Switzerland and so on. Poland scores number 73 uh, out of 184 countries which is good enough and bad enough, uh, I would say. We, we, and we didn't improve much from 77 to, to 73 over the last one year. Uh, so I, I think when talking to politicians and economists, uh, and this is one of the major uh, area of improvement for, 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 for us uh, in, in Poland. I, I would also like to mention about Europe, Western and, and Central altogether as, as one region. And this what is now being cr criticized quite often in the context of Eurozone crisis and so on. Th this could be our strength as well in Europe because this is this, let's, let's call it uh, economic uh, diversity. Um, a little bit like in the United States, we have uh, manufacturing business, tourism, uh, very well developed in Southern Europe. Of course, they have now over-invested in property, so they will be suffering for a decade. Uh, but um, in, in many instances, the diversity of different businesses and, and um, specialization in, in some of the countries can be uh, a very good strength for the U Europe as a region, for European Union as a region uh, uh, going forward. Uh, and also one other factor which is maybe common both for, cent for Central Europe and for the uh, Europe as such is lack of raw materials. And, I, and I'm not particularly worried about this, frankly speaking, because I, I'm more worried about uh, uh, these countries which discover very quickly raw materials, natural resources and exploit them and then fall into the Dutch disease from the 70s as, as you know that the, the, all the other export industries are are pushed away from uh, from the economy by this by the by the natural resources and the high value added industries are not uh, developing uh, at a pace. So uh, it is a common feature where we investing in education, investing in as you said at the outset, Jan, uh, research and development. This is our Achilles heel in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe. It should be uh, accelerated, and, and and I hope that the next budgetary perspective of the EU will cater for this. Frankly speaking, I'm hopeful for this. And I, I think that the interests of the East and West or Central Europe and Western Europe are well aligned from, from this point of view because uh, I, I would also be very much in favor of investing as much of the budget as possible in, in innovativeness into, into uh, research and development rather than common agriculture policy. Uh, and maybe, when, maybe one last comment about something which you mentioned, uh, and for those of our guests who are not from Poland, this is about infrastructure, uh, and, and, and this is uh, a, a huge disadvantage in Poland still, um, in, in infrastructure in particular, in communication, in roads and rail, railways. And, um, and uh, over the next couple of years, I'm really hopeful that we, we will be able to leapfrog or to at least uh, catch up with uh, some other well, de more developed Central Eastern European uh, countries because uh, this is really our Achilles heel and, and, and um, uh, this is the area where I would uh, huge, hugely put pressure on. Thanks very much. Um,
I was actually in, I was in Prague last week uh, talking to their uh, to their road building directorate, and was astonished to have them say that they are uh, jealous of Poland's progress in building roads and legislative improvements, and that's. I think the uh, news to most Poles, because uh, the feeling here is that it's that Poland has the worst uh, road building system in, in in Europe. It just depends which which perspective you have on it. I can only tell you, Jan, that my my, my grandfather was uh, this guy. I don't know how you call him in English, who who was on the railway. Mm -hmm. Um, working on, on the railway in the locomotive actually before the Second World War. And from Krakow to Zakopane, the journey took one hour and 20 minutes. Now it takes almost three hours. From Warsaw to Vilnius, it took four hours. Now it takes nine hours. Yeah. So that's for infrastructure. Yeah, I've been on a train to Minsk from Warsaw, which takes 13. So it's. Uh, um, uh, the. Uh, you mentioned the, um, uh, the the doing business, the World Bank's doing business rankings, and what strikes me is looking at those rankings is the is the success of uh, uh, despite the the bureaucracy, uh, these uh, lack of competitiveness when it comes to the regulatory side, how successful this whole region has been in building and creating businesses, and um, I think one aspect that might be interesting to get the panelists to talk about is is access to capital. And, uh, and financing both through, either through uh, stock markets, which, are, which tend to be very small and not at all Anglo-Saxon, uh, uh, the much larger banking sectors, and other uh, methods of financing and how important and, and essentially what role this plays in, in developing SMEs and, and making this region more competitive. So maybe we could start with Erica. Yeah, I had the pleasure to share um, with the EIB and the European Commission the um, what is called the uh, risk sharing finance facility. It's the the biggest EU fund which we have 10, uh, 10 billion uh, for innovation capital. It's it's loan driven, and what we found uh, interestingly, I mean, uh, very sad actually, that we have very few companies uh, which are financed through this instrument. Uh, from the CE countries, which is of, tells us a lot. I mean, first of all, it's probably not well known. Secondly, um, I mean, uh, the conditions are very high, probably too high, particularly for smaller and for uh, middle-sized companies. Um, and even for large companies, obviously, they shy away. Um, and the same is true in the European Investment Fund. Um, but of course, they're, I mean, they're still independent uh, finance, uh, venture capitalist fund which do some financing. Um, but I, am, I would hope that the, the Polish um, EU presidency actually would look into this and would look into, because it's de debated uh, in the budget um, and the way the EU budget is shaped and how the European Investment Bank and the other kind of instruments function, uh, I would really highly recommend to look into this and see, you know, where the the, the real problems are. Thanks. Uh, maybe we can get our two bankers as well to talk about uh, uh, access to capital and and how uh, that could be changed, improved to make uh, uh, to make the region uh, more competitive. I think uh, to to talk now about the access uh, to the uh, funds is really a big challenge uh, during uh, the crisis. Uh, so, uh, in my opinion, uh, in such conditions, the biggest role still belongs to EU, EU funds. Unfortunately, uh, the experience is uh, not uh, good. And uh, I think that is not good, not only because of the lack of the capacity, administrative capacity of uh, the governments uh, and institutions, governmental institutions in those countries, but also if, uh, uh, because of the uh, bureaucracy uh, in Brussels, which is finally, uh, finally uh, giving bad examples. Uh, I think that uh, some of the some of the uh, results of the uh, history and uh, the examples of uh, Spain, uh, Greece, are showing that uh, that uh, development based only on the improvement of the infrastructure. I don't want uh, to, to say that infrastructure, to improve the infrastructure is a bad thing. Uh, not at all, but, uh, but development based only on uh, funding 
infrastructure and uh, expecting that direct investment in uh, real estate will boost the economy appeared wrong. And we have the examples. Most of our countries are uh, uh, very, uh, have uh, very small uh, internal, internal markets and very low demands. So if uh, if uh, the economy will be not based on export-oriented uh, uh, products, uh, we'll uh, face very soon the problems uh, faced now by, by such uh, countries like Greece, uh, Portugal and Spain. So, and also, uh, now uh, compared to the developed countries, uh, we are spending uh, less than 0.5% of GDP, which is not enough and I don't see I don't think that we can find our uh, own uh, sources uh, to increase this and to uh, to to produce uh, let's say to add value to the to the products for export so this uh, must be a uh, a, a common uh, policy because this is very important I think that Europe Europe needs more than uh, even before uh, needs common efforts to, to strengthen. Uh, to strengthen, it's not so important uh, how we are calling C or not C. It's important uh, to uh, to to uh, let's say to try to cover uh, together the, the uh, together the problems. Because uh, even now we see what is uh, happening with uh, Greek debt. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter uh, Greece will fail in bankruptcy or not, but uh, the, the main problem now is coming back from, uh, back from a sovereign debt uh, to, uh, to commercial debt, <laughs> and uh, this becoming a problem of the holders of Greek bonds. So, so th this is a vicious circle. If we'll not find a solution, we'll face uh, from time to time the same problems. Uh, so about the transport, I, I don't uh, uh, think that is, uh, we can, uh, uh, can uh, uh, let's say, find uh, such hubs like, uh, like Antwerpen and, uh, and, uh, and Amsterdam. And it's not so uh, uh, important in my opinion. In my opinion, of course, we need to improve the transport corridors in Europe. Uh, which are linking different countries and are helping uh, their, uh, let's say, mutual development. Thanks very much. Uh, Matos, uh, taking, picking up on that point, uh, is there a misallocation sometimes of capital that it, that it goes into, uh, uh, into, purpo into purposes which don't really uh, increase competitiveness? Uh, I guess a, a good example was a real estate investment in the, in the Baltics. And is there something that, uh, that the banking sector uh, should be doing to, uh, to improve that post-crisis? Well, absolutely, there, there is. I, I would say that this is all, uh, also one of the key job parties which is, uh, which is now uh, ahead of us. Uh, the one, uh, one which is going to be addressed partially, at least through the Basel III regulations. But uh, let me just give you one or two examples. For instance, uh, in Ireland, uh, Ireland developed uh, fantastically between 1993, 90 four or five through to 2000, uh, 2000 2009 productivity uh, grew um, and there was a very uh, um, uh, appropriate allocation of capital let me say so and then with the arrival of euro uh, when ireland needed a, a little bit of a cooling uh, there was another boom for next six or seven years uh, and and capital flew into uh, real estate and this was uh, the, the, this produced an economy which was hugely uh, over, uh, overheated uh, and, and dangerously overheated and, 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 and the collapse of the economy is now very well, well known. And, and similar situation in the United States, previous 10 years before the crisis, a very cheap money, weak dollar, uh, created a, a space for huge capital inflows, but the capital inflow was not um, into uh, uh, innovativeness, investment, it was into real estate, consumption, and, uh, de and debt, and, and additional debt. So, um, w when you look at, at this, uh, and at the capital and, and credit from this point of view, I would say it can be very dangerous. And, and also, uh, the, the example which you named, um, uh, Jan, the, 
the Baltic states. It's, it, it, it is one of the reasons why they had to have uh, minus 20, minus 25 percent GDP uh, in 2009 because there was huge uh, capital inflow, in particular through the uh, credit by Scandinavian banks, and uh, the productivity could grow, grow only so much. So from 2004 to 2005, all the credit from Scandinavian banks went into real property, or most of this. So, and this created the property bubble again, and, and the bubble burst, and, and, and the, the, there was this huge uh, recession in 2009, 2010. So, uh, and I think one of the reasons why Poland went so relatively smoothly through the cri crisis was that the level of loan, level of lending, level of, level of credit in the Polish economy was relatively low. Actually, in 2009, it was 40 percent. In the Czech Republic and Hungary, it was 80 percent relative to GDP. In some of the Western economies, it was 120. In Spain, for instance, the public debt is not a problem. It's only 70 percent of GDP. It's the private debt, which is households and, and, and the company debt, altogether is 170, 175 percent of GDP. So uh, really, uh, credit is a, a very dangerous toy, a very dangerous phenomenon. And, and I believe that we will observe an uh, a, a, a awful lot of new regulation. Uh, Basel II uh, was actually uh, overtaken by Basel III now, about the net st stable funding ratio, uh, liquidity coverage ratio, mm, leverage ratio, capital ratios, and so on. And, and all, all together, they, they are going to address exactly your question, you know, uh, how to ab absorb, how to, how to uh, um, uh, encourage the cap capital inflow, but at the same time, uh, how not to be um, uh, undermined by this capital inflow. And maybe one, w one more example, which is extremely interesting, because for the first time of the last 20 years, uh, a, a vibrant new economy, a vibrant economy introduced uh, taxes, new taxes on capital inflow, or so-called Tobin taxes, and these were um, these were this was Brazil and some other Latin American countries, and this was exactly because of the, some currency wars, as as the, your famous chief economist commentator Martin Wolf said, uh, asked, uh, is there a, uh, is there a currency war actually right now with the China? Uh, um, uh, artificially uh, depressing their currency. And Martin Wolf, who is usually uh, not very radical in his statement, he said, yes, there is a currency war. So we are in, in such a dangerous state now where capital flows are, are very much uh, influenced by the uh, relative exchange rates uh, between different countries. Uh, and, and the impact of the new regulation uh, will be huge and must be huge in order not to um, undermine the uh, shaky uh, development of, of, of many of the countries. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> a big part of these panels is to get some audience uh, participation. So if, if anyone has any questions or points that they'd like to bring up, uh, ask the panel. Um, go right ahead. Um, I would like to go back to the issue of regions. Because I think you're thinking a little bit too small here. There is a very important region which has already developed, and in fact it developed a thousand years ago, and that's called the Baltic region. And if you look at a, it's very instructive, by the way, for Poland, for these countries, to look at a polar projection map of the world. If you look at a polar projection map of the world, you find out that the Baltic region is right in the center between North America, Russia, China, Southern Europe. South America is the only area which is sort of left out. And that the um, transport routes are developing faster than you can imagine. And that uh, the industrial heartland of Europe, which is essentially Germany and Austria and Switzerland, are tuning in to the Chinese market really fast. You also have the smaller region, Poland, north through the Baltics to St. Petersburg to Helsinki. Helsinki has developed itself into the main um, airport hub from the west out to China. Uh, these are all extremely rich economies, and they all have multilateral companies, multinational companies who are extending off into Asia. This is an immense opportunity for Poland, which you are missing completely because of the uh, failed investment in transport infrastructure. 
Um, Berlin is opening up a new big international airport, actually a year from this week, is hopefully. It was supposed to be this week, so who knows. But um, Warsaw Airport, or another airport in Poland, could have been just as good a hub. But nobody will come to Poland first because the airports are too old, and, the, and as you, you gave very dramatic statistics about rail travel. But uh, this is where the future is going to lie. And um, you have, in Berlin, I live in Berlin, you have Spanish investors, that be, before the crisis even, coming to Berlin and investing because they see the infrastructure going out to Asia. So Poland is in the center, really, of one of Europe's most important regions, which is the Baltic Sea region. But even more than that, this Baltic Sea region is geographically placed to be really a central point between North America, Europe, and Asia. And since Europe has such an unbelievable industrial infrastructure, it's going to be able to take account of this. So if I were a Polish economic planner, I would, I would get a polar projection map and put it up on the wall every day and look at it and see how Poland could fit better into this structure. Thanks very much. Um, there's, I, I've talked to Czech companies who uh, ship through Germany. They should be shipping straight north through Poland, but you're right. The rail links aren't there. The road links aren't there. Uh, the ports aren't developed enough. Yeah. It's if I can just say one other thing. For, for, for generations, the two main ports for Central Asia have been Helsinki and Hamburg. Not since 1950 or 1945, but for generations. Um, this, this, these links are already very well developed. And when I first learned that Kazakhstan ships most of its goods through Hamburg, I couldn't believe it. But it's it's because the, there's no other good sea route, and there's where Poland would be a little bit disadvantaged because Hamburg is chosen because it's North Sea and not Baltic Sea. Right. But still, the the, the the possibilities for Poland are immense in this field. I see Erica actually has a uh, a uh, torn out map uh, of that very picture. Yeah, because one other one other air, uh, way of understanding region is actually to look at airport hubs. And, and I just love what you, um, I mean, your, your point to look at the whole Baltic regions and then to include Poland and all of the, the, um, uh, the, the, the regions which are just uh, touching on the Baltic. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and I'm surprised that I haven't thought about it because I know the Baltics very well and I know Poland very well and I know the other countries, but I haven't made the connection myself. But when you look at this map, actually, which which is from, from the, from the, uh, here from the Polish airline lot. Um, I mean, you can see and you can understand immediately what you are saying. Um, and it's so, it is so obvious. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that you, that you mentioned this. I, I will look into the data and the numbers because it's always important. Just by the way, one argument when coming back to the book, I mean, but there are many other um, ways of looking into it. It's not the, the size of the population which matters. Of course, it's good if you have a, I mean, a big size like uh, the, um, the region Brussels, uh, which I mentioned, Twerp and, and Amsterdam, which is 65 million. Uh, incredible, just to believe, 65 million. Um, but I mean, there are other areas. When you look to the, the, the Silicon Valley belt, it's actually population. It's quite small. It's not a big population. So the, um, the population alone is not an indicator for economic strength. Um, Yes, it's the brain power. It's where people love to live, where it's easy to live, where money wants to move, um, um, where the venture capital people like to, like to be, where there is a solid government, reliable government, reliable policy, uh, all this together, um, and where young people like to move. Migration, by the way, is a big factor, where people like to move to, like to live from, from other countries. Um, the startup companies in Silicon Valley alone, between, if I'm not wrong, between 87 and, no, between 97 and, and 2000 or something, don't get, I have to look at the numbers. Um, uh, um, the startup companies, 25% are from India and from China. Um, and I think this is important, openness. Um, but you get this automatically if you think in big pictures. That's why I like uh, your recommendation to do this. Go ahead. So yeah, I agree that it's economy is very, very important, infrastructure is important, but the question is what makes region competitive in global economy? 
I think that it's not enough. Because as I, if we, I understand the region as a society, as a group of people, so we must ask what ability has to have such a society. I think there are two very important abilities. One is to shape all unique path. Another is to create strong and easy to distinguish regional identity. I say as a group of people, personality. There are two very important factors and because the external context is changing very quickly, dynamically, of course we cannot understand the shaping path like in driving through the roads. We must understand it to accumulation on invisible asset. Very important and invisible asset and because, and also another factor is that we must build mechanism to mobilizing this asset in given moment to the most important changing in time threats or um, this one, oh, challenges, threats and challenges. S it's not easy. It's not as, as able to make two, two five years. It takes decades to be first moral capital on the basis of moral capital, uh, social capital. This is a real foundation of competitiveness, on innovativeness and so on. Of course, infrastructure for such abilities is necessary on the step-by-step -step develop. In the I told, uh, it is my personal experience, and uh, from, it was, 20 years ago, where exchange starts. I stuck on, it was my understanding of the region. How to implement changes. And I think that from this point, if we don't start, of course I understand politicians would start to speak at the, about the moral capital or the values, it's work, we must work. And there are some conditions external. I'll say only one very important from point of view. This is a condition to introduce a special subsidiarity law. That is, that step, it will be many steps on the steps of region, on the steps of state, on the steps of Europe. Because when we will broke uh, some fre uh, thresholds, so this will be not, uh, not work because the power must go from the ground, from the region up to states, from state to, from a citizen. Uh, so it is very simple to understand, but I don't see any effort in Europe, in uh, European countries to introduce such system. It should be some law, special subsidiarity law on the level of European Union. We don't need other laws from Europe, the only this one. Thank you very much. Of course, I say too much about too, mo uh, too strong, but I, uh, I am very motivated to this <laughs> solution. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, we, we've mentioned on the panel a little bit, a little bit about uh, social and, and moral capital, and uh, uh, that it is, uh, as you said, uh, an issue that goes much beyond. Uh, simple infrastructure but but build sort of the sinews I guess of, 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 a, of a functioning economy um, maybe we'd ask uh, Tsutan to uh, if you've uh, got any thoughts on you know a, a country which has undergone uh, dramatic and radical change do you see um, the uh, the buildup of, of social capital are, are people reacting uh, differently to uh, to the, to the state to issues like corruption uh, sort of Everything from public spaces to to honesty in in government departments, uh, that sort of thing, uh, in uh, in taking ownership of their society more than under under communism. You see that twenty years is very short 
the theory at the historical point of view in order to change the mind of the people who was uh, under full communist control for more than uh, 45 years. 45 years means two generations of Bulgarians who lost, uh, who lost uh, their, uh, even uh, uh, their um, 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 desire for freedom, uh, their uh, comprehension of market economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think that uh, we're going on, on the uh, right way, but still we, we need uh, more time. I'm sure that uh, not only the society, uh, society now is finding uh, uh, the, um, the values of the, 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 of the freedom of the free market uh, economy. Uh, I still think that uh, we need uh, more changes in the mentality of the people, in the heads of the people, but uh, also we need uh, some changes in our politicians, in the heads of our politicians, because uh, they have been uh, created uh, for the last 20 years. They didn't have uh, time uh, even uh, to build up their own mentality. And uh, this one of the, the problems, uh, somehow, uh, somehow uh, politicians, uh, at least in my country, in my country I, I don't know exactly the, the experience in the other countries, especially new newcomers. Uh, they prefer to to to, uh, to implement the hate uh, between uh, between the the people, between the business, let's say, and uh, and uh, the poor people, uh, in order to protect themselves. So I think uh, that uh, that. Uh, slowly, slowly uh, will change uh, the mind of the people, but also will change uh, some of the values of our even political system. I mean, the, the, uh, the internal values, I'm not talking about general values. I'm sure that uh, there is no, no Bulgarian or very few of uh, Bulgarians are not uh, trusting in the values of uh, Euro-Atlantic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, system or route of uh, development, but uh, internally we still need more changes. And you can also make an argument, I guess, that, that a lot of these countries had fairly low social capital even before communism arrived uh, after the war, and uh, that that what we're dealing with now is something that 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 has existed for a very long time. But this is simply a part of Europe which which has long lagged uh, the west of the continent when it, when it comes to, to building, uh, building those types of uh, issues. Does anybody else have anything, any points that they'd like to raise? No. Um, maybe if you would like to, to, to comment a little bit on this, uh, on the, this building of social capital uh, issue. Um, how, again, to, to bring the focus back a bit to Central Europe, but. Do you see that as something that uh, that could cause this region to lag um, once the obvious sort of uh, infrastructure and other types of uh, investments are made? That simply uh, low uh, low social capital could be something that 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 holds that holds this uh, this part of Europe back. Uh, I mean, it's very hard to answer, but I cannot imagine because I think the pull uh, from the global economy and our global society is so strong that I cannot see that this region will disintegrate. Um, I mean, it's well-educated population. Um, I mean, uh, so even if, um, you know, part of the, um, I mean, the, the, the social fabric uh, is not there um, or is not as strong as in other countries, I mean, there's still other values which are highly well-developed. And I think they will, they will make up, uh, you know, of the things which are missing because you can bridge a lot with intelligence and, and with know-how and knowledge and it doesn't always have to take, you know, a generation, you know, to overcome, I think, historical problems. Um, so the, I think the pull effect will be very strong. The only negative effect might be, you know, when Europe really um, turns into more critical development. Um, so we will have more failure coming up and this will have an effect on the, on the global economy. It will automatically have an effect uh, a more even stronger effect here. 
uh, in, uh, felt in this region negatively, probably. I mean, I'm guessing in a moment. Well, what's a uh, what sort of failure? I mean, imagine, you know, we will have um, the situation which we see in, in Greece. Um, I mean, it will become, um, and, and Greece will not remain the only story, but it will be become as severe as in Greece, you know, in, in, in Spain and, and Italy and... and uh, maybe Portugal Island, we don't know how, you know, if it will really master. I mean, in, in a moment it looks on, on a better path, but I mean, that's what I mean. It all depends, you know, we don't know how China will develop, will there be a big bubble, uh, will it burst? Um, I mean, there's so many factors in the moment unknown. Will Obama master uh, the economic task, you know? Um, I mean, so many unknown factors right now that something can severely can happen. And if this is the case, and, and Europe is not capable of mastering it, its own difficulty and external factors, uh, economic factors I'm talking about now, not foreign policy related factors, I could imagine, yes. Uh, but otherwise, I, I, I mean, if we master this very difficult path for um, most countries globally in a moment, I think we, um, this region will do fine. Great, thanks. I thought I saw that you wanted to jump in at the end. Maybe uh, one uh, additional element which I, I would like to add to this discussion about the social capital and trust and uh, social fabric. Uh, so so we, we spoke about communism and, and this was a criminal system and, and this undermined um, terribly the, the social fabric. But when, uh, when, we, when I look at uh, Polish society and, and some other in Central Eastern Europe uh, as well, I would say that one of the... Um, uh, job parties which uh, which are ahead of us is the demographics because it can it can undermine the uh, social fabric yet yet again uh, we had a quite a strong demographics uh, demography uh, over the last of the previous um, 50, 50 years right after the second world war and then um, into the 90s and then uh, the demography, uh, the, the, the growth of the population stagnated uh, or, or even um, uh, went back uh, comparing to, 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 to many other nations. And what I mean by this is that there is a, a, a generational dispute now and dilemma uh, where you know the uh, younger generation now uh, is more and more aware about uh, that they will have to pay for the uh, for the generation of their fathers and grandfathers, uh, and they don't don't like it, and they don't know they know that once they will reach the retirement age, they will not receive the same level of benefits uh, as the as their father fathers and and grandfathers. So, it, it, at least in Poland, during the discussion about the pension funds over the last 12, 18 months. I realized that there, this is increasingly dangerous element of, of dissipation, of, 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 of disruption of, uh, of the social fabric. So we have to work, in other words, we have to work on pro-family or demography or immigration policy. Um, and maybe not to repeat, maybe we have an opportunity not to repeat some, some of the mistakes which, which some of the Western European countries made. Uh, which Angela Merkel now gently said that multiculturalism is not working. So we can uh, maybe work more towards uh, immigra Im um, encouraging immigration from similar cultural circles and so on and so forth. So this is an issue uh, for me. You're, you're right that it's going to, it's going to be a, a huge challenge. I, mean, you'd, I think it was you who made the, the point earlier about the migration out of the Baltic countries. Uh, a few years ago, I, I talked to the uh, Lithuanian labor minister who said uh, it was 10 or 15% of the working age population of Lithuania had already left to work in Western Europe. He said it was the largest peacetime migration ever, in, uh, in, as far as he knew. It was larger than the, than the Irish potato famine when it came to the percentage of people who'd, who'd left a country. And it's only increased since then. And uh, you're right on the, on the issue of uh, mig migrants starting to arrive and changing the, uh, the composition of the region. I think we have one more uh, comment here from the, from the floor. Uh, Piotr Kaczynski from SEPS in Brussels. Um, just to bring, bring in uh, an old debate about uh, convergence, and the question is, in convergence uh, in the EU dead? Uh, since, uh, since the South uh, seems to be uh, in constant uh, 
regress and the uh, Baltic Sea of uh, countries around it are growing either f between 4 and 8 percent, each one of them this year. Um, are we still, should we bury the convergence, the, the idea of, of getting European national uh, economies more and more convergent, or we should uh, just uh, embrace the new reality that uh, uh, those economies are more and more actually diverging and are going to diverging? And that's common question number one. And the second is, how about this... Um, this idea the, that is widely discussed in Brussels these days, that uh, the old uh, EMU was lacking E, uh, that is Economic Monetary Union. Um, we had the Monetary Union, but not the Economic Union. Uh, and this is uh, the, one of the reasons why, uh, why Greece is uh, so devastating for us, while California, uh, whose uh, share in the American economy is uh, much more important than Greek for Eurozone, for that matter. Um, good, there is a connection. Um, a, is, uh, dem is more damaging for, for Eurozone than California is for the dollar zone, so to speak. Um, so what about this economic union and what are the chances of it? Great, thanks very much. Um, on the uh, economic diversion, it's, it's interesting when you talk to Czech and, and Polish politicians, um, they see themselves as very much being part of Northern Europe, sort of a Germano-Scandinavian, which I guess, or a Baltic, really, region, that they're uh, fiscally conservative, entrepreneurial, uh, uh, Protestant, in a way, even though Poland is not a Protestant country, but, but Poland's making a, a strong push to push itself as far away from being in a Mediterranean mindset as possible as it sees its future being as northern as, as possible. Maybe we could ask one of our, one of our bankers to, to comment a bit on the, uh, on the divergence and, uh, and uh, EMU. Well. Yeah, I do, with the, to your first question, Piotr, about um, the convergence, divergence, I think that the, the divergence which is now happening is dangerous not in, in the European Union, it's dangerous in the uh, economic and monetary union. Uh, and this is because uh, the famous optimum <laughs> currency areas theory uh, tells very precisely what needs to happen in order for economic area to be uh, a viable economic uh, a viable monetary union um, there has to be a mobility of labor mobility of capital but but at the same time there has to be a, a real macroeconomic and microeconomic uh, convergence if this is not happening and if there is not uh, any kind of common uh, fiscal and an economic uh, policy, or very little of this at least, then in s having one common currency like the euro is, uh, this can be a, a dangerous experiment. And, and, and this is, we are experiencing this right now with Greece and, and, and Portugal and the rest who, are, uh, who, who should have actually very, low, very, very much higher interest rates throughout the noughties, and they were, the interest rates were very low, and therefore the bubbles, and therefore the burst, and so on and so forth. So this is about the, the convergence divergence in, in, the, in, the, in the United States, for instance. The, uh, the states are very much divergent from each other, but the mobility and this divergence can be a strength. So uh, therefore, I'm... Uh, I wouldn't like to be quoted by Financial Times or anybody else, but, but I, therefore I'm a little bit skeptical about the, not so much Eurozone as such, but maybe Poland joining prematurely Eurozone. And the, the other question w was about the uh, E from the EMU, Economic and Monetary Union. And absolutely, I agree with you uh, that there should be, if, if, there, if this is to be, uh, uh, um, this, the, the monetary union has to um, survive, there, there has to be, uh, more and more of this uh, common fiscal and, and economic policy. And at least the, uh, an acid test for this, there will be this discussion about the euro, bond, the euro bonds. If uh, the, the, your, your famous colleague from University of Leuven, Paul de Graua, said in one of his uh, fantastic papers uh, written last month, that in, in there, there have, have to be such a euro bonds if, if, the, if the crisis has to, is to be overcome. Because uh, uh, if, uh, if this, uh, this does not happen, uh, then uh, the countries which issue uh, debt, like Spain, 
and Portugal and, and Ireland and Greece will see capital outflows, enormous capital outflows, and euro uh, can flow to the other countries because there is huge euro, euro market in Germany, in France and elsewhere, and, and people do not have to invest in, in those peripheral uh, countries. So, uh, so this is the first step and there will be a first sign of uh, will there be any economy, real, real economic uh, union between the uh, Eurozone uh, countries. Was this more or less your question? Okay. Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm getting grim looks from, uh, from management, so I think that we're, uh, we're slightly over time, so uh, we'll uh, have to bring the panel to a close. Thank you very much for your participation, and thanks to the panelists for, uh, for taking part.